I think people think that this whole class is online. Yes. What is the zoom method you can see here? The total class for the eight people. Oh, you don't want to sit so far up, you can sit down. But actually, if you all sit very far up, right? Also good. You know why? Maybe I can take off the mask. It's too far away. Not as you don't report me. Uh. Oh, so you want me to wear mask? Okay. <laughs> I think you just bring a face shield next time. I also think so, yeah. Won't die one. In Taiwan, a lot of people die after that. You don't come after that. You don't die. You don't die. Are you excited about this party? No. <laughs> yes, it's mad. Yeah, actually, I am a. Uh, I teach math, you know. I teach every type of math here. I'm from the math department. So it's a bit difficult for me to enthuse you, to make you enthusiastic 
but we'll try. <laughs> I actually is the only thing that I know. I make a living out of doing that. So I hope to make you enthusiastic about this subject. Whether or not I'm successful, we'll see. But at least PC, right? I shouldn't move around, right? Okay, so as I mentioned, uh, that I am uh, Vincent Tan, and uh, there are two tutors, myself and Dr. Chow Lee. And basically, this is a class on probability. So these are our meeting times. You can just read this. I'm not going to talk about this. But here, I want to highlight that there exists this thing called office hours. Every week, we will have office hours at Friday. 4 p.m. at my engineering office. I also have another office in the maths department, but this is where we will meet. Okay. If some people want to meet over Zoom at the same time, then you will use my Zoom account, which is there. No password. So you need to know some math in order to appreciate this class. Okay. But if you do not know any math, then you have to pick up very quickly. You are expected to have patience and diligence, you know. That means we need to be precise in our thinking, and I will tell you how we can be precise, okay? So everyone must have this book, but this book is in the Luminous. You can go and download it and keep it with you. You want to print out the whole thing, it's up to you also. Where? But actually, we only cover probability. Yes, we only cover probability, okay? And precisely what we will cover is all here. And we will follow this to the letter. All right. So when we talk about when I say we will cover X, then you are expected to read this part of the book. When I cover this, you read, you read this, you can read this. If I cover this on this day, you read this. So this is the necessary reading. 
because I will not be able to cover that whole two sections or the two chapters. So there are additional examples there. So you can read. Okay, that is the reading. Right. So the assessments are as follows. You can look at this. There will be two quizzes. There's nothing surprising about them. They are here. Okay, after the Chinese New Year. Quiz one, quiz one here will cover these topics. Chapter one. Quiz two here will cover chapter two. Very clear, right? And then the final will of course cover everything. All right. So in addition to that, there are three graded homeworks. Three graded homeworks. What is the what is the meaning of three? There are actually four homeworks. If you see from the schedule here, right? There are four homeworks. Homework one out, homework one due, homework two out, homework two due, all the way until homework four due. Okay? Homework is like home, primary school homework. You need to turn it in. But you turn it in in Luminous. You write down, you take a photo, and you turn it in. Upload. So why, why are there only three? Right here, why are there only three? Because I allow you to drop the worst one. So every homework will be graded out of 10. All right, but the top three will be taken. So even if you get 40 out of 40 for the four homeworks, you will only be given 30 marks. So you can actually don't do one homework and you can still get the 12% here. So in view of this, right, there are no extensions whatsoever, which means that, okay, if you feel that uh, you are sick today and you cannot do this homework on the last minute, you don't do it. All right, and you can still get two marks if you do the rest of the three properly. Okay. So this homework uh, is 12%. You can talk to people. You can talk to your friends, but you are expected to write out the whole thing by yourself. Okay? All right, there's some bit of integrity, okay? But 12%, I expect to give 12% to everybody. Okay, the only things that will differentiate your marks are quiz one, quiz two, and the final exam. And I already mentioned in an email and in the Telegram chat, that for the quizzes and the exams, you in person. If you don't show up in person, there's no Zoom proctoring. Okay? There's no Zoom proctoring. Yes. Exam won't be here. Exam, the university will give us our special room. But the quizzes will be here. It's big enough. 50 people can sit here. So, there is no Zoom proctoring because I prefer complete integrity. I prefer the old-fashioned style of... Uh, of sitting for exams, so there is no possibility. So it's fair for everybody. Uh, you won't say that, oh, these two people are cheating. Right? So it's completely fair. Old fashioned style. I think a lot of students also prefer old fashioned style rather than Zoom proctoring because you can be very honest, but you do not know whether other people collaborate or not. The old fashioned way is complete integrity. Okay? And complete fairness in everywhere. So these are the rules of the class. Any questions? Paper quiz, yes. Old fashioned stuff. Old level stuff. Write on paper. Give the paper back to me. Okay. Yeah, this is the way I teach. Right. So everything is very deterministic. I tell you in advance when the homework is out, when the homework is due. And when I say the homework is due on a particular day, it is due on 5 p.m. that day. No, not even one second extension. All right, so you should uh, plan in advance. Okay, you can miss one, but then you have to do the rest properly. But I encourage you to do all four properly. Okay. Any questions from the audience? Any questions from the Zoom people? Any questions? Feel free to stop me anytime, okay? Feel free to stop me anytime. Any questions on the rules? So you download the book, you read the book, okay? The tutorial questions will be from the book. The tutors will go through some questions from the book. So I don't have to recite the questions. And the questions from the book are pretty good. No questions? Cool. So this is a class on probability. But because I don't like to talk too much about math at the very beginning, let us start with uh, illusion. All right. What is an illusion? 
All right. So we have three rooms, three doors actually, door A, door B, and door C. You do not know what is behind each door, but behind one of the doors is a car, and a car is very expensive. Behind the other two doors is a donkeys, and donkeys are not very expensive. So now, the game show host shows you three doors, and you do not know what is behind each door. You only see closed door, closed doors. Okay, you do not see what is behind. You do not see the red things here in the picture. You do not see the red things. Okay, so the game is as follows. All right, the game is as follows. Number one, you state which door you want to pick. Okay, then you are going to play, and then there's a game show host. Let's call the game show host Monty. Game show host. You pick a particular door. All right. Game to host opens one of the other two doors. The other two doors. And there is no car there. Okay, so the scenario is as follows. So you, in fact, you do not know that uh, these positions are here. And the game show host actually now opened this door. And then what you see is, oh, there is no car, there is a donkey. Okay, the game show host opens a door in which there is no car there. Initially, you could have chosen a door with a car or a donkey. Right, the game show host knows which door has a car, which two doors have donkeys. The game show host also knows which door you open. So here, for example, you open the first door, door A. All right. Then in the two remaining doors, the game show host knows that C, C door, C door. You open door with what is done here. Okay. Now, at this moment, At this moment, there are two doors. There are two doors. One of which now Monty asks you, do you want to switch? Do you want to switch your initial choice? So he asked you, do you want to switch? So I ask you, do you want to switch? Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference? Yes, no, maybe. So if you think about this problem, right? Oh, maybe you should just switch because we believe in our original luck. We believe that what we have chosen initially is actually the lucky door, and we are going to win a car. Because right, Mon Monty opened a door with a donkey. And I didn't tell you this, but you can believe this, that the car is equiprobable, equiprobable 33% in each room, in each door. So, oh, in the remaining two doors, uh, if I keep my choice, I have a 50% chance of winning, right? If I keep my choice. Because I know that, oh, in the remaining two doors, there's two doors, all right? There could be car, no car, or no car. And I chose one of the two, so 50%, 50%. So do you want to change or do you want to believe your initial luck? A lot of people like to believe their initial luck, like to believe the 40 number that they, that they bought is the very best number in the world. So face this situation, do you want to change? Oh. So, 
Some people know that this is the Monty Hall problem. Good. How are we going to solve this problem? We are going to solve this problem by probability in this class. Yes. And if you are faced with this problem and you're an engineer and you know nothing about probability, what will you do? You would do the following. Simulate it. Let us see. It'll do 1,000 words. Okay, this is written in MATLAB. Maybe you don't know MATLAB, but maybe you don't know Python. It's the same thing. All right. So, uh -huh. this one price. The price is the car. All right. My pick. And he is going to reveal the door. Which is a set difference. Set difference means I take away the first pick and the price up to three. The first could be the price. In which case, this set here only has one element. All right. So we are going to, Monty is going to choose a door in which we didn't choose. And Monty is going to choose a door that does not be. I'm trying to take Can you talk to me? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? This one? So right now your mic. Oh, so should I use this one or the top one? Hello, can you hear me? Hello? 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 Um, Quite soft. Maybe this is... Hello, oh, can you hear me? No? Uh, is this better? Okay. Maybe I have to use the same as system. Yeah, okay. Can 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 most people confirm that they can hear me? Okay, cool. All right, cool. All right. So basically, let me get back to here. If there are any issues, just let me know in the chat. But I may not check the chat too periodically, so let me know somehow. Okay. So here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to record the chance, the instance that I win the prize if I switch. So here, out of a thousand times, I'm going to record the times that I, the number of times that I win if I do switch. And here, if I don't switch, all right? So here, I'm going to print out of this 1,000 outcomes, if I switch, if I don't switch, what is the chance that I win, okay? So, so 
as you can see here, oh my gosh, this has no the, such toolbox. Okay, but on my computer, it works. All right, so I do not know why, but this MATLAB does not work. All right, so basically you will see that, all right, what this says is that out of a thousand times, here is around six, six, six times. If you run this most of the time. On my, work, on my machine, it works, but here something is not installed, so I cannot make it work. All right, so out of a thousand times, if you switch, on average, you actually will win 666 or 667 times. And this is about two thirds. So if you switch, you have a two thirds chance of winning. And can you explain why this is the case? So some people in the chat already alluded to that, that this is the Monty Hall problem. And the purpose of me telling you this is for you to be excited about probability and learning about conditional probability in a proper way, as which is what we will do in this class, okay? So I don't know how excited you are about this. I don't know how excited you are about this, but uh, I find this very paradoxical because if you, if you open, if Monty opens the door, okay, it seems like you only have two choices left. And it seems equiprobable. Equiprobable means 50, 50%. But if you run this program and if it can be run, then you will see that most of the time you are in this regime here. Two thirds time you'll win if you do switch, okay? So I, I wrote this program, but you know, it doesn't work here. I don't know why, but it is what it is. I may post this code so that you can work on, you can play with it, okay? Now let's get down to something more boring. And I have to talk about this not so exciting thing. That's just too bad because we need to talk about sets. All right, so I need to get on to the first part of the lecture, okay, in which we talk about sets. And this reading here is section 1.1 of the Berzeka and Sisyclus book, BT book. Okay, by the way, I have no lecture notes. You copy this or you read the book. You don't have to copy this because I will post these handwritten things. All right, we do it the old fashioned way. All right, this is how I was taught. I was taught blackboard, you know, blackboard. <laughs> yeah, but that's still the best way of teaching and learning. All right, so today we will understand sets and set operations. Unfortunately, we have to go back to what is the meaning of a set. Okay, and let me open the chat so that uh, people can, listen, can, can talk to me. All right, so a set in mathematics is a collection of objects. But how do we specify sets? Okay, the uh, objects of a set are called elements of the set. Okay, a set is a collection of objects. The objects of a set are called elements. If S is a set and X is an element of S, we write X belongs to S. This is read as belongs to. So this is a mathematical symbol that we will always be using. And the Zoom pe and the people in the class cannot see this. Okay. All right. So if, however, S is a set and X does not, is okay, maybe the right, the right English is, is not an element of S, we write X does not belong to S. All right, and this is read as does not belong to. So this is basically some notational issues that we need to, 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 to get, get out of the way. Now the empty set is the set with no elements. And 
is denoted as phi. Okay, so um, yeah, this is a set with no elements. It is a very special set that we give a special symbol phi. Okay, and uh, in case you do latex, this is empty set. There's such a there's such a note there's such a symbol. Okay. So there's some here, here are some notations that we use to write sets. Notation for sets. Okay, we follow the book. Now, if S is a set with finitely many elements, that means there are only finitely many elements inside the set. Say x1 x2 all the way up to xn, we write this as, as s equals to x1, x2, dot, 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 xn. Okay? Now, a set is written with curly brackets. If you write this, x1, dot, 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 xn, this is not acceptable. This is a tuple. It's ordered. All right, so there's an order x1 comes before x2, comes before x3, comes before xn. The first line here, this line here, this is unordered. All right, this is not in the book. A set is just an unordered collection of objects. This here, the second thing here, this here is ordered. All right, and we will talk about this ordering later on. Okay, unordered. Okay, so here are some examples. Uh, the set of outcomes of a uh, coin toss. Okay, S is basically heads, tails. We must use these curly brackets for a set. Must always. Okay. Next thing is next example here is another example. Oh, I don't mean to do this this thing. The set of outcomes of a, a dice throw. So in this case here, you know, a regular dice has six faces. You need to know that. Okay. One, two, three, four, five, six. This dot, dot, dot basically means the logical thing in between. All right. So a set must have all these uh, notation. We must use this, nothing else. All right. This is a math rule. Now, of course, here we only talk about finitely many elements, but in this class, we have to deal with infinitely many elements, all right? So if S consists, that means contains, of infinitely many elements, X1, X2, all the way up, so on, so forth, then, and, these can be arranged in a list. Then we can write S in the natural way. X1, X2, and so on, like this. Okay, so in this case here, if it can be arranged in a list like this, then we call the set countable. All right, but in order for me to talk about with a real math meaning of countable, this requires me to spend maybe one hour. Okay, in a proper math class, we will talk about what is countable because there are many things that are uncountable. But in this class, we will just say that if the elements of a set can be arranged in a list like this, then it is countable. We don't have to worry about the meaning of countable. If you go to Wikipedia, there's a real proper meaning of it but it requires too much time for me to talk about what's countable, all right? Now, then it's countable or countably infinite, right? So for example, the set, let's say E equals to zero, two, minus two, plus four, minus four, and basically all these are even numbers. So set E of even numbers, is countably infinite. There are many things that are not countable, countably infinite. 
Okay, there are many things that are not countable, but there are many things that are countable, many sets that are countable also. Here is one set that is countable, but it's very difficult to show that it's countable. All right, uh, and we will not do this. All right, example. Okay, the set of rational numbers. The set of rational numbers is usually given this symbol Q. I don't know why, but it's a set of all numbers that look like this M over N, such that M and N are integers and N is not equal to zero. Okay, now I have not talked about this notation yet and I will talk about this. This set is countable. This set is, now countable, means countably infinite or finite. This set is countably infinite. Okay. Now to show this requires some effort that we will not go through, but in a standard math class, we will go through this. Now, how do we specify sets? We specify the properties that the elements of the set must satisfy. Of set satisfied. Okay, so S, we can write S as the following way. Now, we can write S, say the set of all even numbers. Even means you divide by two, it's still an integer. Okay, that's the meaning of even. So zero is an even number because if you divide by two, it is still an integer. Integer means whole number. Okay, now you can specify, an, a, 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 basically you can specify um, the set of all even numbers in this way that you enumerate, you write down like that. But it's kind of long-winded. We don't like long-winded things, okay? So we can specify the properties that the elements of the set satisfy by writing down the following K, say, put this bar here. This bar is read as such that K over two is an integer. Maybe I call this E to be consistent. Is the set of even numbers. So basically, this set here and this set here are the same thing, uh, but they are represented in different ways. Why? Now, in the first way, I enumerate all the even numbers. In the second way, I specify a property that the even numbers must satisfy. What is the property? The property is that if you divide by two, you still get an integer. So you need to put this K here and you need to put this straight line here. This straight line is to be read such that all the numbers K such that k over two remains an integer. Understand? Yeah. Yeah. So k, I'm looking at all the numbers k, such that if I divide the number k by two, it is an integer. Now, okay, you can test. Okay, now you take this number. You divide by two, what you get? Minus two. It is still an integer, right? Yes. Now, if you take, or say five, Okay, it does five belong to this set. Five over two is no longer an integer. Cannot, it does not belong to this set. So basically this slash here, this straight line here is such that, understand? All right, some books do the following. Our book does not do the following, but my, all my books, all, all the books that I write do the following. Okay, alternatively, you can write E equals to K dot dot. Colon is also okay, but our book does not do it. K over two is an integer. Okay, so this dot dot is also okay. Sometimes it says space when you type. Okay, so more generally, you write S such that X, X satisfies Property P, property P, okay? Or dot dot, all right? Dot dot is also okay. All right, so another example is the unit interval. All right, so here we have the real line. The real line, so this is the set of all real numbers. You know, real numbers, uh, near numbers are actually a very complicated, or complicated set, all right? Why does the set of all real numbers exist? All right, that's something that we will teach uh, undergraduate in math. Okay, 
But let's assume that we know what are real numbers. They can be arranged on this line here, okay? And so the set of all real numbers from zero to one, right? This is the set of all real numbers from zero to one inclusive. Okay, how do we represent that? Let's say we call that set I is the set of all Xs such that zero less than equal to X less than equal to one. So basically this is the X satisfies property P. Understand? So this set I is a set of all real numbers between zero and one inclusive. Inclusive means that it includes the endpoints zero and one. Now, people also write this as the following zero, one, bracket, bracket, close bracket like that. Okay? This is called the closed unit interval. All right. So, any questions here? Any questions? From the Zoom people, any questions? Can you still hear me? Elvin Chi, can you hear me? So square bracket can be used. Okay. So now, for example, if we do open bracket, this open bracket like this, this is called the open interval. Okay. This is a set of all axes such that we don't include the endpoints. So this here corresponds to this inequality here. This inequality here, strict inequality this here, corresponds to this here. So this is called an open interval. Now you could also have half closed, half open. Okay, x such that zero less than equal to x less than one. Okay, so this corresponds to this here, corresponds to this strict here. Is it clear? Is it clear? All right, so this half closed, half, why is it called closed? Why is it called open? This one requires two or three lectures to explain. This is the closed unit interval. Okay, but never mind. For all intents and purposes, you don't need to worry about this. Any questions? Now, unfortunately, we have to go through all these very painful things, but we have to accept it. Inclusions and equality. That's the next thing we want to talk about. Now, Sets can be included in one another. The picture is as follows. The set here is S and T, S, F, S lives inside T. All right, so what does this mean? Okay, if every element of S is also an element of T, we say S is a subset of T, or S is included in T. And write this as S subset T. Okay, and the picture is what I just drew here. If every element of S, so basically the picture is as follows. If I take a particular element of S here, this, this dot here, can you see this dot? Can you see this dot? This dot is in S, but it's also in T. And if I do this for every element of S, it's also in T. Let's take this other one. It's also inside T. Right? Then we write this special symbol here. This is called subset. F is a subset of T. Okay? Now, if it's true that if S is a subset of T, and T is a subset of S, then we say that the two sets are equal. Then S, then the two sets are equal. And we write this as S equal to T. Now, for all the math that we have done up to now, right? I don't know about you, but we have said that x equals to five. X is a certain variable, and we say that it's equal to five. We are equating number to number. But in math, we can equate other types of objects to other types of objects, like set is equal to set. Now, what does it mean for a set to be equal to a set? When I ask you to prove that a set is equal to a set, there's only one way to do it, all right? 
Okay. As an aside, remark to show that a set is equal to another set, we need to show that S is a subset of T and T is a subset of S. There's no other way. All right. Basically, we need to show that every element in S belongs to an element in T and every element in T belongs to S as well. There's only one way to do it. I didn't notice, I didn't realize this until very late in life. So I'm telling you early in life. Okay. Now, another remark is the following. Another remark is the following. Now, if it, show, if it happens that S is equal to T, two sets are the same, right? Um, okay, let me just scrape this. Uh, uh, some, let me just write some books, right? S like this, with this thing underneath. Okay, this line underneath. Now, we will not use this. Okay, we will stick to the book and we won't, we won't use this. Okay, so now note that another remark is that S belong to S subset T does not mean strict inclusion. Does not necessarily mean strict inclusion. It does not mean that there is some element in T not in S. Okay, so this does not, does not necessarily mean this picture here. Does not, necess does not necessarily mean strict inclusion. Okay, so if this is true, we could have the situation that S is equal to T. We don't preclude this situation. Okay, we don't preclude this. But we are not going to create this sort of symbol that is overly complicated. Okay, any questions here? Am I complicating? Uh, David Woodside asks, is there any difference between these two symbols? Now, there is no difference, except that we will not use this symbol here because the book does not use this. And I want to keep the symbols as minimal as possible. Okay, they are synonymous. Yes, yeah, synonymous. Right, if we want strict, some people like to use strict set inclusion, they will do this. Okay, but we will not do this. There is no need to do this in this class. And I don't want to confuse people. Okay. So set operations. And here we will provide some examples. Okay. Set operations. Now, in probability that we will do, we have to often talk about the universal set. Say all the outcomes of your experiment. Say if you toss a coin, the universal set is head tails. Those are the only possible outcomes. We will talk about the universal set and the universal set is called omega, okay? Now, if we are given a set, the complement of S is, S is SC, okay? That is the set of omega take away S, okay? So basically your, your whole universe is omega here. That's all possible outcomes. And S is here, all right? So your S is basically here, that's your S. And omega take away S means all the elements in omega that are not in S. So that is the S complement here. Okay, that is S complement. Right? So this is the part S complement. That's called a complement of S. Okay? And basically the definition is the following. All the elements in omega such that X does not belong to S. Understand? Any questions here? All the elements in omega, because we only have elements inside omega, all the elements in omega that are not in S. So that is the complement of S. Okay? Now, here is a small exercise. Or maybe not exercise, it's just an observation. What is the complement of omega? What's the complement of omega? We have already introduced this set just now. Yes, 
Empty set, phi. Perfect. This is the empty set. And the complement of the empty set? Universe. Okay, so here are some examples. All right. We need to talk about the intersection of sets. Intersection is also called N. All right. So S intersect T is the set of all elements X in omega, such that X belongs to S and S X belongs to T. So the picture is as follows. S here, T here, and this is the whole omega. And the intersection is basically this part here. That is S intersect T. Okay, so we are intersecting these two sets. So here's an example. S is basically A, B, C. We enumerate all the elements. T is C, D, E. Then obviously S intersect T is nothing but the common element, which is C. Okay. Now, some people would write equals to C like this. They will get zero marks. Because this C alone here equals C, the C here is not a set, it's an element of a set. There's a big difference between you put the sets in this curly brackets and you leave the C alone. This is illegal. Don't do this. Or not allowed. There's a big difference. Okay. So this in the chat, people ask, what is this? Okay. So we are going to define as take away T. This is called set difference. Set difference is equal to S intersect T complement. Okay, S intersect T complement. So the picture is as follows. This is S and this is T. Okay, so S intersect T complement is those elements in S but are not in T. Okay, so S intersect T, sorry, S diff T is this part here. All the elements in S but are not in T. So you take away the common part. So does that answer your question, Cheng Wei Chiao? All right. Any, does that answer your question, this, this symbol? No, no reaction. Okay, never mind. So we need to also define the union. Okay, union is all. All, okay. The picture is as follows. You have two sets, S and T. And S union T is the set of all elements in the universe such that X belongs to S or X belongs to T. And it is denoted as and the picture is as follows. S union T is basically this part here. Everything in S or in T. Okay, and that is the universe. Usually I don't label the universe, okay? Understand? Okay, so let us go back to this example here where S and T are the following. And let's figure out what is the union. Okay, so you basically look at all the elements in S and T, A, B, C, D, E. Now, some people would give the following, C, D, E like this. They would get how many marks? Zero. A set cannot have repeated elements. There's no such thing as a repeated element in a set. That's, that has a name in math, it's called a multi-set, but we are not allowed to repeat this. You need to get rid of this, okay? So this is S union T. Understand? Is my example correct? Okay, that is the union. Okay. Right. So we are also allowed, and this gets into the point of being a little bit challenging. We are also allowed to take intersection or union of infinitely many sets. Okay. 
So when we write union n equals to one to infinity like this, right? The n is at the bottom, the infinity is at the top. It's something like, you know, hey, if you come across this sum n running from one to infinity like this, you have come across this, right? So there's the sum symbol, summation symbol that we will have to use quite frequently. But this symbol here that I've just written out is an infinite union. And we write Sn like this. What we mean is S1, union, S2, union, S3, union, so and so. So the way to say this in English is all the x in the universe, such that x belongs to Sn for some n. For some. Now in math, there's a big, big difference between for some and for all. That means if x belongs to Sn for some n, that means I can find an n such that S, x belongs to the Sn. So here's a picture. This is S1. This is S2. This is X3. Okay, and I have a certain element here, X. Yes, this element X here belongs to the union of X, S1, S2, S3 for some N. And that for some n, some n here refers to the three here because I can find the number three such that x belongs to x three. Okay, you would contrast this to the next thing I'm going to talk about. Contrast this to the next thing I'm going to talk about. All right, this is this is called, by the way, this is called infinite union. All right, so mm, exercise. For the student, say S I S N S N is equal to zero, one minus one over n. This is the interval from zero to one minus one over n. Okay, so for example, S one is equal to zero element. S two is equal to the interval zero one half. S three is equal to zero. 2 over 3, S4 is equal to 0, 3 over 4. Exercise, what is union Sn, n running from 1 to infinity? This is an infinite union, it's not an infinite summation. Okay, what is this? So, someone figure this out and tell me, no need now, you can do it later. It's an interval. It's something that I talked about just now. But is it close here, open here, close here, open there? You can figure it out. Okay, I can tell you later. Okay, so this is not so easy. Yes, thank you very much. What's your name? This is equal to close here, open there. So this is a set of all numbers x in, in the real number, set of all real numbers, such that zero is included, but one is excluded. Thank you. Huh? With me, you won't fail. So this is, I've just talked about infinite union. Now let's talk about infinite intersection. I'm very nice, we won't fail. Infinite intersection, Sn. All right, this can be written in long form, S1 intersect S2 intersect S3 intersect S4 and so on and so forth, but I don't want to write everything. Okay, so this is all the axes in the universe such that X belongs to Sn for all N. This makes a huge difference for all. So the picture is as follows. You have many sets, say three sets because I can only draw three. And you ask, okay, let's look at this element here. Does it belong to every set, S1, S2, S3? This little dot here, does it belong to every set? Yes. So it belongs to the intersection of these three sets. So here, this is the, this part here represents S1, intersect S2, intersect S3. We can write this as up to three, n equals to one Sn. We can write it in this way. Okay, that's the infinite intersection. 
All right. Hmm. How about exercise? I cannot think of a good exercise now. Never mind. These, these sort of things are not so easy. But maybe let us conclude this one hour lecture with a interesting result. Okay. Result from everything that we have learned. This is called the Morgan's Laws. Maybe you have heard of it before. Okay. If I take the union, S N complement, then I get the intersection, S N complement like this. Okay. So here, what I'm doing is I'm taking the infinite union, then I take the complement. Here, I'm taking the complement of all the individual sets and then take the intersection. Now, when we are faced with a situation like this, what do we do? When I ask you to try to believe this, what is an engineer going to do at the very beginning? Panic. But we don't panic. An engineer will draw a picture. Let's see whether it's believable. Okay, so this is our universe. The rectangle is our universe. This S1, S2, S3. Hmm. Let's say we are not going all the way up to infinity. We only take up to three. Then where is, where is the left-hand side? Okay, the left-hand side is here. The complement of the union. Can you see? Do you believe me? The complement of the union. Ah, this is the left-hand side. The complement of the union. Now, as I mentioned, now let's sketch what is the right-hand side. Okay, let's sketch what's the right-hand side. Now we take the intersection of the, we take the intersection of the complements. Oh, let's complement S1. Okay, the complement of S1 is this part here. We, are not, we don't involve S1, the complement of S1. Okay. Then we take the complement of S2. The complement of S2 is this part here. This, I, I don't want to touch the S2. I complement the S2 here. And then I complement the S3, and you can see where I'm going. Am I running out of colors? Maybe here. Now, a complement of S3 is here. Now, then you take the intersection of all these colors. Complement of S3 is this brown color thing. You take the. Where, where do all three colors overlap? Exactly the yellow part. The way I've drawn it is a bit messy. You go back and draw it again. You will see that these two sets are the same. Now, this is the engineer or the, you know, the picture way of drawing things. But we can argue about this formally. Proof. Now this, naturally, you know, I, I'm, I'm a math person. We do theorem proof, but Is it because, yeah, it's because one minus one, one tends to one asymptotically, exactly. Yeah. Thank you, David. Now, proof sounds very, very formal. So let's say justification of this. Now, the left hand side is a set, the right hand side is a set. What is the only way to show that two things are equal, two sets are equal? You show that every element on the left hand side is an element on the right hand side. That's what we will do. And then you show that every element on the right hand side, is an element on the left-hand side. That's the only way. I'm only going to do one direction. You are going to do the other direction. Justification of this direction. That means justification that union and as an subset intersection and as an complement. We are going to show this. Okay? We are going to show this. Okay? Now, let 
X belong to union N as N complement. Now, this union N here, all right, is the same as this, so that I don't write so much. So what does this mean? Okay. This means that X does not belong to union N as N. It does not belong to the union. Okay. This means that if I do not belong to the union, then X does not belong to SN for every, for, or for every, for all. I think we use the word for all. For all N. If you do not belong to the union, you do not belong to any of the sets. Right? If you don't belong to the union of all the sets, you don't belong to any or one of them. Okay? So that means that X belongs to SN complement for every or for all. For all is the same as for every, okay? N. So what we have shown is that X belongs to intersection of SN complement. You follow the logic here? One more time. In order to show that two sets are the same, there's only one and only one way. You show that the left-hand side set is a subset of the right-hand side set. How do you show that? You take an element on the left-hand side set here. And you interpret what that means. So if X belongs to the complement of something, that means it does not belong to that something, first and foremost. Next thing is, you think about what it means for X not to belong to the union. The union is, a, is everything, right? So union of these three things is the all, all of them. So X must be here. It must be outside. It cannot be in any one of the sets. Okay, does not belong to X as N for every N. Now, if S, if sorry, if X does not belong to S N, it belongs to the complement of S N. So X belongs to the complement for every N. You can replace the every if by all if you want to be consistent. All also can. So this line here, this line here is this mathematical line here. X belongs to the intersection of S and complement. And we see that this here now is exactly this thing here now. And so we have proved, we have justified this inclusion here. And the opposite inclusion, exercise for the student. The other way, exercise for the student. Reverse all these implications. Can yourself. By the book, but this is what the book says. You do, uh, I will do this for you. You do the opposite. Cannot do it? Ask me. This is where we will end today. Any questions? Oh, by the way, this is how I teach. Uh, blackboard. When there was still Blackboard, I teach Blackboard. Huh? Any questions? Any questions from the Zoom people? people? Every week we have office hours. You can ask me about homework, but I won't give you the answer. You can ask me about tutorial. I will give you the answer. Why will you fill this subject? You know, if you say this right, before we fight the war, we already surrender to the opposition. Is this the way you were taught in school? Before we take the exam, we say, oh my gosh, I'm not going to do it. This is defeatist, right? So we should soldier on. By the way, uh, this is the first time I'm teaching this class, so it could be very bad. But I guarantee you that it will not be so bad because I'll try my best, so you should try your best. Okay, thank you. Good night. Everybody uh, in the Zoom, I will see you soon on Thursday. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. They'll be recording straight away, okay?